Great. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, annual Digital uh, Scriptorium members meeting. Um, we're doing this remotely. I hope uh, next year we will be returning to some kind of in-person meeting, but this year seemed to work best to do it remotely. And um, we also have a lot of things to vote on and dis information to disseminate to members. And I think remote uh, gives us a lot more opportunity to do that kind of um, dissemination of information. So thank you for coming, for taking part of your uh, Wednesday afternoon lunch hour uh, and to spend it with us. Um, so this meeting is our chance, the, the board of directors chance to report out and conduct the business of Digital Scriptorium, um, including this year board elections and uh, the approval of new members, which we're very excited about. It's also an opportunity for members, you know, voting members to weigh in uh, with their votes uh, and for anyone really to uh, ask any questions, express any concerns, uh, whatever that you want to bring to the board. And, and you know, we have time built into the agenda for, for questions. Uh, we're gonna start with just reporting out uh, with the director's report and then a treasurer's report, uh, a member services report. And member services is a sort of an ad hoc position that we've added in the last year. And then Lisa Fagan Davis will end with a report on the advisory council. And then we're gonna have our new membership approval. Um, has, does everyone, has everyone gotten a link to the agenda that has the information? Okay, I sent one out uh, by email earlier today. And then we'll move to the board of director uh, elections where we have three positions that we need to fill. Um, that should take, I hope, about a half hour. And then we're gonna have an update on DS 2.0 uh, presented by the project manager, LP Colet Angelo and Doug Emery, who's our, I would say he's our technical consultant. He does quite a bit more than consult these days and is probably better described as our technical developer at the moment. And then we're gonna end with a virtual collections visit to the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Uh, who will be joining Digital Scriptorium as a new member. Um, we are, we're unfortunately not able to have uh, the Harry Ransom Center and the Smithsonian Libraries uh, we're not, are, are not able to be here today, uh, but I think we're gonna ha be having more meetings where we're gonna, for example, launch uh, hopefully soon uh, DS 2.0, and we'll have more opportunities to uh, uh, bring uh, Aaron Pratt and uh, Tamar Evangelista Doherty uh, to the table and they can talk about their collections then. Um, one good thing about the remote meeting is that we can do this with some frequency. Uh, so I think we will be looking forward to other um, opportunities to meet. But let's get started with the purposes of this meeting. Um, I'll start with my report and we'll read that out. So throughout my first year as president and executive director of Digital Scriptorium, I have been really heartened by the support and dedication of the DS membership as the organization continues to move through really significant changes in its technical and organizational platforms. While these changes depart in many ways from the original vision of the DS founders to create a comprehensive and detailed descriptive catalog of manuscripts in US collections, they allow us instead to build a sustainable infrastructure for a national union catalog based on linked open data, principles, and technologies. As the DS 2.0 project manager LP Coladangelo will report, we are within weeks of launching a publicly accessible beta version that will make official the beginning of a new era for digital scriptorium. Speaking on behalf of the current board of directors, we are grateful for the trust and faith that our membership has placed in our work as we have navigated through this process of change and advancement. In addition to overseeing the rede redevelopment of the DS, <clears throat> excuse me, technical platform, a focus of my first year has been to build upon the work of my predecessor, Deborah Ashen, who is joining us, uh, to strengthen DS's organizational platform to ensure its long-term sustainability. With DS established as a tax-exempt nonprofit 501c3 entity, 
and overseen by a board of directors governed by a consortium of by, by, governed by consortium bylaws, Diaz has been able to move away from a strict dependence on a host institution for financial management and is now able, as many of you will have noticed, to invoice and collect dues from members to fund the management of its operations. As a result, for example, DS now manages its own website, which had previously and generously been, been, been maintained by University of California, Berkeley. Taking responsibility for these operations means that we can function with greater agility and flexibility. It also means that we can function with more transparently and with greater accountability to our membership. Indeed, increasing transparency and accountability has been part of a larger strategy to strengthen relationships with our member institutions and the people at those institutions whose work is affected by DS participation. We have worked to create new lines of communication that include regu regular updates from the project manager to membership and stakeholders um, about the progress of DS 2.0 and related news. Since December of last year, 2021, Board member Sue Stoyer, LP Colodangelo, and I have conducted member outreach meetings with staff at over 20 member institutions. These meetings have been an opportunity to speak directly with member representatives, library administration, catalogers, and technical services staff to communicate directly about changes to DS, what will be required from members, and what members can expect in return. The meetings have been highly productive and a great opportunity for us to learn more about our member institutions and to make connections beyond the curatorial level so that DS is understood as a library project as opposed to a curator's project. If you are on this call and you haven't uh, had a meeting with us, please do reach out. We have sent out invitations to every member, but those may have gone to spam or a member representative could have changed. So if you or wanting a meeting, please, please do reach out to me. Our membership outreach has also extended to prospective members. We are pleased to be presenting two new members for approval at this meeting, the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library and the Smithsonian Libraries, and one returning member, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. We will begin a stronger push for new membership once DS 2.0 has launched, but we're heartened by the willingness of these institutions to join us at this critical time. Having established the building blocks for organizational stability and growth, the board of directors will focus in the next 12 months on increasing membership to ensure financial stability of DS for the long term. We will also need to review our fee structure for membership. In an effort to support institutions with fewer resources, we have already created a new category of membership called supporting member, which allows members to voluntarily pay a higher fee toward the support of DS. We are immensely grateful to institutions who have already agreed to be supporting members, including the Harry Ransom Center, the Beinecke Library at Yale University, Princeton University, Harvard University, and Columbia University. We will also seek further funding opportunities to continue developing DS 2.0 and to build programming that supports the work of DS membership and scholarship related to pre-modern manuscripts and US collections. While our application this year to the IMLS National Leadership Grant Grants for Libraries was not ultimately funded, the support that reviewers showed for the project was highly encouraging and we will continue seeking support from other programs. Thanks to bridge funding collected in 2020 from the Beinecke Library, Princeton University, University of California, Berkeley and Riverside, Harvard University, the Huntington Library and Columbia University, we have been able to continue project management, the project management position created by the previous IMLS planning grant. And we anticipate be, being able to use dues to continue this position into the future beginning in fiscal year 2024. In closing this report, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the board of directors for their service over the past year and the outgoing Vice President Janine Pollack of the Free Library of Philadelphia, Secretary David Falds, University of California, Berkeley, Treasurer Vanessa Wilkie from the Huntington Library, and members at large, Tamar Evangelista Doherty, who was formerly of Cornell University when she joined the board, 
and is now at the Smithsonian Libraries. Susan Stoyer at Western Michigan University and outgoing member Ray Clemens uh, at the, from the Beinecke Library. And with all sort of heartfelt uh, emotion without their support, but the achievements of this last year would not have been possible. So I end my report here. I think we'll move to the next report and then at the end of the reports, we'll have a few minutes for any questions. So thank you very much. And uh, Vanessa, you are up. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to share with you this year's treasurer's report. Um, which will dovetail a lot with what Lynn has just said. This was a year of financial transition for Digital Scriptorium as we migrated away from UC Berkeley. Cal used to manage, uh, hold and manage all of DS's income based on membership dues, while the DS board maintained a checking and savings account with minimal activity. As a DS board meeting held in Penn in June 2022, the board, the board voted to become financially independent and not rely on a host institution to manage DS finances. Since that time, the DS executive director, treasurer, and project manager have developed financial management um, and invoicing plans. All of this has been done with close oversight from the rest of the board. The one exception to DS's complete financial independence is the remaining bridge funding raised in the last fiscal year, which remains under the control of Penn and is used to pay salaries of the DS project manager through fiscal year 2024 and DS 2.0 expenses. The balance of the bridge funding is $40,000. Once these funds are depleted, DS will be completely responsible for its financial management. DS's income is based primarily on membership fees determined by the DS fee schedule. As Lynn mentioned, in June 2022, the board voted to establish a higher tier of membership, the supporting member, what, uh, where larger institutions may opt to pay a flat membership fee of $3,500. Currently, five institutions have become supporting members, and we thank them for this support. DS has adopted QuickBooks as its financial management platform and uses it for invoicing. The 38 member institutions, not all dues paying, received their invoices via email on 19 September 2022. DS has collected $15,000 in membership dues with $25,750 still outstanding. The board anticipates future recurring expenses for the remainder of this year to be minimal um, subscription fees for website registration and QuickBooks. DS anticipates one large scale expense in the coming year $20,000 for the interface, which will be covered by bridge funding. On 2 January 2022, DS received an anonymous donation of $30 in memory of Robert Derling, PhD, and in honor of Nancy Vine Derling, PhD. The board is grateful for this thoughtful gift. As of today, Digital Scriptorium's bank account balances are in our checking account $13,686.68 and in our savings account, $10,005.18. Thank you. Over to Sue. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was unmuted. <laughs> um. A lot of the things I plan to cover have already been addressed, but I, I will uh, mention that um, we've had the member meetings. They have been really helpful, I think, in looking at how we can ingest and implement DAS 2.0 in a way that works for member institutions and end users. Um, and to be in touch with Lynn, if you haven't had one of those meetings or you would like another one. <laughs> We are thrilled to accept three members, the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, the Harry Ransom Center, and the Smithsonian Institute Libraries. This year, we haven't worked very heavily on recruiting new institutions, so we can focus on the implementation of DS 2.0. But once that's up and running, we expect to be contacting more manuscript repositories in the hope that we can have a true national union catalog of manuscript materials. We've introduced the supporting membership category, which we've already covered, but we've also uh, started thinking about another kind of membership, which is anchor membership. 
We recognize that not all institutions have the cataloging support to provide even cursory entries for their materials. And so we're hoping to develop a system of anchor members, which are institutions that are willing to help their neighbors with descriptions. This was kind of inspired by the manuscripts on the periphery program from Indiana University, which has helped make some relatively unknown collections visible to researchers. This membership category will help further the consortia's aspirations to promote manuscript study and accessibility to pre-modern manuscripts, and will recognize institutions who have the willingness and capability to assist institutions who don't have a cataloger or even perhaps a medievalist who can identify the text of an undescribed manuscript. Once we have the material in DS 2.0, we hope that they'll attract researchers who can help fill in additional descriptive details beyond the scope of what of the minimal description. Speaking for myself, it's been a pleasure to meet people through these member meetings, and we really look forward to developing the consortium in a way that benefits each institution and furthers this area of study throughout the country and the world. And I can pass it on to Lisa. All right, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. It's nice to see you all. Um, just a very quick report on the Advisory Council. The Advisory Council uh, has developed over the last few years into a body comprised of manuscript scholars, and we are here to represent the user community. I serve on the board ex officio uh, and as a liaison between the board and the Advisory Council. This year, uh, in addition to my serving on the board, I also have been serving on the advisory uh, committee for DS 2.0, which also gives me an opportunity to speak on behalf of the AC and also to um, think about the new DS 2.0 model uh, from the perspective of the scholarly and teaching and student and research communities. We also regularized our term limits um, for the AC service is for three years with the option of a second. That's my dog. I apologize. Settle down, buddy. Sorry about that. They're workmen and I like it. Uh, and then the last thing to report is uh, this year we are saying goodbye to two members whose terms are ending. Bill Stoneman, formerly of the Houghton Library, uh, and Barbara Shaler, who has been with Digital Scriptorium literally from the beginning. She was at the original DS meetings uh, in 1996 when uh, the project was just a, a gleam in everyone's eyes. And I'm very, very grateful to both of them for their decades of service to Digital Scriptorium. We welcome two new members, uh, David Gullo from the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library and Kivilchim Yavuz, formerly at the University of Kansas and now at the University of Leeds. Remaining on the committee are myself, Elizabeth Hebbard from Indiana University, Eric Johnson from Ohio State, and our, um, our foremother in all of this, uh, the great Consuelo Dutchke. And we look forward to working with the board uh, as we see DS 2.0 towards its launch. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa, Sue, and Vanessa. Um, does anyone have any questions for us at this point? I'll look at the chat. Feel free to put questions in the chat as they come up. And if there aren't any questions, uh, I think we can move to the next item on the agenda, which is the DS 2.0 update. Uh, LP, the screen is yours. Great, thank you, Lynn. Um, I think Doug is going to be the one to share the slides if you give him that capacity. Brilliant. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Lynn mentioned, my name All is- All right, LP. Yes. I skipped, the, I skipped like the most important part of this meeting, which is the voting. And um, I just stepped aside. <laughs> on, the, on the news, sorry about that. 
um, a little early. That's right. just sort of getting relaxed into these like presentations and enjoying them. Um, so, uh, Sue, we do need to do a uh, vote, vote on the, the new uh, members, which I hope is, is, is a formality. And then we'll, we'll move to the, um, the board of directors election. Um, Sue, do you wanna go ahead and do that? Okay, yes. Yeah. So we have, we have three new members that we'd like to, we'd like everyone who is a voting member to just put yes in the chat if you're willing to accept these three members. And if you have some objection, please voice that now. But we'd like to have a written record for our minutes that, that we had the membership vote. So um, if you would all please just, if you're the member, the voting uh, person for your institution, just put yes in the chat to everyone. I have to do that too, because I am my institution's voting member. Um, give everybody one more second and then. All right. I think we can consider those members approved. And thank you all for, for voting. And we can move on to the next item on the agenda, Lynn. Okay, great, thanks. And welcome to uh, the Harry Ransom Center at Smithsonian Libraries in Buffalo and Erie County Public Libraries. It's great to have uh, you on board as members. Uh, moving on to the elections for the board of directors. Uh, I think that's gonna be Janine Pollock. Yes. I see Janine. Yeah, there you are. Hi, everyone. And welcome and thank you for be, participating, being a part of this. Um, so we have uh, three open positions. Um, one is a um, a position that is uh, someone is already in the position, but it's just um, to renew a for a three year term. Tamar Evangelista Doherty um, is up for nomination, uh, is, is from 2022 to 2025. And that will be her first three-year term. She's already had a one-year term. And um, then she's eligible for another three-year term. So at this time, I would like everyone who is a voting member to put into the chat, yay or nay for Tamar Evangelista Doherty. And I should say, um, oh, as Lynn mentioned already, Smithsonian Libraries. Thanks, everyone. Um, Next up is Aaron Pratt uh, from the Harry Ransom Center for the University of Texas, Austin, who will be, is, is up for a one-year partial term with the possibility of two additional three-year terms. Um, am, Lynn, am I reading the bio or has that already been shared or? How? I, don't, I don't think we need. To yeah. read unless someone would like us to read the bio, but it's been shared. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay. Um, so at this time, uh, please place your vote. Cast your vote. Yeah, your name for Aaron Pratt. Okay, and uh, next for uh, standing for one three-year term with the possibility of one additional three-year term is Emily Rund, uh, curator of medieval and Renaissance collections at Columbia. And um, at this time, please cast your vote for Emily. OK, 
Okay, it looks like all are have been voted yes and um, are in. So Tamar, Aaron, and Emily, thank you so much for being willing to serve. And, um, and we'll be sending you an invite to the next board meeting. <laughs> Yes. That's this meeting. Been warned. <laughs> um, I also, I think we we also need to uh, need a motion to approve Sue Sawyer's appointment to vice president to replace Janine Pollitt. Um, so I will move to uh, to re to to appoint Sue Sawyer to replace uh, Janine. Can we get a second? Second. Second. And uh, again, in the chat, uh, if, please vote uh, with your institutions just to approve that motion. I'm glad everyone's so agreeable. It makes our job a lot easier. All right, great. So, um, yeah, I just want to reiterate my thanks to Aaron, uh, Emily, and Tamar for agreeing to uh, to to stand for election. Uh, just to give a note of explanation for the, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, we uh, began uh, a process to stagger the seats on the board so that we want to have you know one board signing off and then a brand new board beginning, and so that's the that's the explanation for these sort of strange. Um, one-year appointments, uh, two-year appointments, and such. Awesome. Um, are there any questions so far? Any further questions? Great. Now, LP, please, hey. the screen yeah. is yours. Brilliant. Thank you, Lynn. Um, congratulations to, all, uh, to the new member institutions and to the new board members and board positions. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, my name is LP Colodangelo. I'm the uh, project manager for the DS 2.0 um, redevelopment. And um, Doug Emery and I are gonna share um, some uh, updates with you regarding um, the implementation progress and um, some other sort of housekeeping things that I wanted to cover. Um, and with that, uh, Doug, if you would be willing to go to the first slide. Um, so this um, is to update you just generally uh, on the on our timeline. And the good news is, is that we are on schedule. Um, so in this, uh, as approaching the and, and working through the fall season, um, we've finalized our workflows in terms of what we anticipate for how to extract data, how to transform and enrich it, and then um, how that data will be uploaded to uh, our new linked database through, uh, through Wikibase, which uh, Doug will talk more about. In addition to that, um, Doug has developed a local version of the prototype. So while it's not publicly available, and that's for um, sort of multiple reasons, both that it's in development and, and security issues, um, it appears to be functioning as we intended. And um, sort of running ahead of schedule is, um, talking with and discussing development of our user interface. And that is the, the public facing website that's gonna sit sort of in between where the, um, where the user and the database is. Um, so this uh, user interface is now in development. We're working with web developers on that um, and that, that progress is moving very swiftly. Um, we anticipate that by the end of uh, this year, um, we will have a completed Sort of prototype to be able to move in the beta version and all um, and what that means then for early in the next year in 2023 is that our beta version is really initiated it's the the first sort of um, live real version of the new um, ds database and that's going to be initiated by member data contributions and i'll talk a little bit about what that looks like at the end of our talk um, also happening in early 2023 is um, as the user interface is developed, we'll be doing some user testing and that will be on uh, specific features and functions as, um, as our web developers um, decide that, that they have items that they want to user test. And then finally, I think we're on track uh, to have the user interface uh, fully launched by the spring 
of next year. The next slide. So this is our agenda uh, for the talk. Um, we're gonna hopefully run very quickly through some of these items, um, but uh, I'm available and Doug, I believe is available to talk about any of these through. Um, if you have more questions, please um, you feel free to email me um, and then I can, I can sort of channel them to the right place. Um, but with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug for some of his portions. We're gonna go a little bit back and forth um, to cover different sections of our talk. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so a, a key part of our work over the, and particularly early this summer was ensuring that no data was lost as we migrated from the uh, Berkeley hosted digital scriptorium to the new version for two purposes. One, we wanna preserve that record. And the other is that we wanna provide a bridge between uh, for users who want to access digital scriptorium data from the time, again, between the time that uh, the Berkeley hosting ended and new DS is available in the new year. So to this end, uh, we created, well, LP created a community on Zenodo. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Zenodo is a product of a uh, CERN funded project. CERN is the, the scientific research agency in Europe to support hosting of an open ac and, and open access to scientific data sets. Now it hosts many more types of data sets uh, beyond just scientific data sets. And we chose it to provide open access to digital scriptorium legacy data. We've uploaded each manuscript's uh, description uh, from the WebGenDB HTML page along with images and metadata. Additionally, a PDF version of the same and the MetXML that provides the backing for the WebGenDB that was hosted at Cal. Each institution's uh, DS has a separate archive for its data on Zenodo with a zip file each for the HTML and image data, a zip file for the PDF, and a zip file for the XML data. So this is means that if you wanted to download in bulk all of the data that was uh, a facsimile of all of the information that was on uh, a DS as it was hosted on Berkeley, this is available to you. Now, while DS provides bulk access to the entirety of each contributor's manuscript descriptions in their different formats, it is not good enough for search or accessing individual records. To fill this gap, uh, Jesse Dummer, who works with me at Penn and Penn Library's Cultural Heritage Computing Group, has uploaded PDFs of all of the DS legacy manuscript descriptions with uh, basic metadata to the Internet Archive. Uh, right now, uh, we have under the Digital Scriptorium account the DS legacy data collection, which is all of the some eight thousand. Well, it's seventy nine results now, but it, it, there, it'll be growing. Uh, 8,000 plus uh, digital scriptorium records. And she's going to be creating sub collections for each of the institutions that are that make contributions. <clears throat> Here's an example of a little bit of what that looks like. This is one record from uh, the state of California Sutro collection. This is the, the PDF, the top portion of the PDF, and then down below metadata that's been extracted from that record that's available for research. So another um, exciting uh, development that we were able to leverage um, through essentially the same kind of uh, procedure that's afforded to um, preserve those individual legacy data records um, is also going to be useful for our image hosting. Um, again, this is um, in development. So I'm going to show you one example. Um, Jesse's been nice enough to to, to doctor up one example of what this looks like. Um, but on the next slide here, you'll see, um, so this is um, an image of, um, manuscript image uploaded to Internet Archive through our DS account. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, how this becomes functional. So um, when you upload an image, um, 
or really anything to, to Internet Archive in this capacity, um, it renders a URL. And the middle part of that URL is the identifier for this particular item. And so this is uh, this particular these um, manuscript images that have been uploaded to Internet Archive. And it's that uh, that identifier that we then plug into in the next slide a generic URI that's used to generate the manifest, the IIIF manifest for this image. So um, what's cool about this is that Internet Archive essentially provides um, free of charge um, manifests, uh, IIIF manifests and, and, and um, IIIF uh, capable uh, image hosting so that when you take this particular uh, URI that you've plugged your identifier into, you can put it into any other IIIF compliant image viewer, in this case, Mirador, and you're able to get um, all the functionality of uh, IIIF um, for our purposes, free of charge. So um, this has been a, a, a really great development for us to um, be able to host, in this case, legacy images, folks that um, had no other place to put their images. Um, and so as a stopgap, as a temporary measure, um, we've been able to to uh, generate a plan to put them in Internet Archive and to make them to make the manifests available in this way. Um, I also want to make a uh, a little bit of a reminder to you that in addition to um, all of the open source work we've been doing in terms of providing data and image hosting, um, on the next slide you'll see that um, you can uh, get access to all of our um, procedures in terms of how we uh, transform the data and what our data dictionaries look like, our metadata repositories, our uh, Sparkle testing, Sparkle query testing. That's all on our GitHub, which is at github.com slash digital scriptorium. So again, that's all open source as well. Over the past year, uh, most of our work has been in refining and extending our workflows for processing source data and enriching and ingesting that data into our prototype Wikibase instance uh, following our linked data model. Here's the diagram that you've seen of our, I think that all, most of you have probably seen of our data processing workflow, uh, another too small to read diagram uh, image of our data model. And then this next slide shows you these are all of the uh, data types in Wikibase, as well as the properties that are used for mapping that data into our Wikibase data model. We've continued to refine our enrichment of process, our, our process for enriching data, for connecting uh, manuscript data to linked data authorities on the web. So uh, the, the, at present, these are the the, vocab the types of data and the vocabularies that we are uh, using for our linked data enrichment for centuries, materials, roles. We are linking to the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, uh, languages and people and organizations. We are using uh, Wikidata identifiers to link those items, places for those we're using the Getty Thesaurus of Geographic Names. And then terms are a slightly more complex uh, beast. They connect to a number of different terms as represented, a different, number of different vocabularies as represented in our source data. Uh, so for, there we're linking at present to the Getty Oric and Architecture Thesaurus, OCL FAST, which is the faceting uh, uh, identifiers for LC subject headings, and the Legatus language of binding vocabulary. So we've been doing a, a lot of development has focused on both extracting data and then ingesting that data into our uh, Wikibase instance and having uh, representing uh, the, these records according to that model and after they've been enriched. The data extraction and data ingestion processes have continued to progress and it's nearly complete for the generation of new DS records in our Wikibase instance. So significantly, uh, and this is a key part of the services, the, what the service that Wikibase will, that DS will be offering, we have now integrated DSIDs 
for manuscripts and DS name IDs for people and organizations with our data processes. processes. These uh, identifiers will be Digital Scriptorium's permanent digital identifiers for manuscripts, people and organizations uh, on the web for citation purposes, as well as for linking. So this, it, this record here shows that, and I will stress that this is all test data, so you can't rely on these numbers being the numbers that are used in the future, but this is a record from the University of Kansas, a commentary on the Pauline epistles by Peter Lombard, and it has DS identifier DS1878. Uh, further down in the record, in the upper left-hand corner, probably a little bit too small, maybe too small to see, is uh, the associated name is recorded, Peter Lombard, who is an author, who is also found in our authority file. This is found over here on the right upper right-hand side of the page. Uh, this is in our uh, wiki-based instance. Peter Lombard has the DS name, the DSID DS name 251, again, a temporary uh, value for purposes of, uh, for, of testing. And then also uh, the QID, the Wikidata QID that links uh, Peter Lombard to Wikidata. On the right here, you see uh, an excerpt of the lower right, you see an excerpt of the Peter Lombard record uh, on Wikidata. And LP is going to be talking a little bit more about our uh, name authority work in a, in a few minutes. There are and let me back up real quickly and say that, that as we get closer to our uh, beta release, we will have a public av publicly available Wikibase instance so that user, so the members will be able to look at the look at the data, and we will begin ingesting data into production digital scriptorium. This process will assign the permanent DS IDs and DS name IDs. And we will, at that point, begin contact, contacting members about our process for accepting and ingesting manuscript records. Our workflow will include returning to each contributor the data that is generated, the, the data that we enrich uh, as in the format that we have floated into uh, our Wikibase instance with DSIDs for each record. The updated descriptions submitted to DS any updated descriptions that are submitted to DS will need to include existing DS IDs so that the new descriptions can be linked to the correct manuscripts. This workflow will be worked out and we'll be in touch with members um, in, in time to uh, explain the process and to talk about other types of data that will need to be provided. A couple of different kinds of, a couple of the other kinds of questions that we'll be uh, answering are, how to make sure that we have links to institutional records if those are not provided uh, in the source data, and also how to have provide links to IIIF manifests, again, if those are not provided in the source data. These are the, these are the main outstanding development tasks that we have for our, uh, for our data extraction and ingest process. As I just mentioned, we want to be able to output imported records as CSVs with associated DSIDs along with them. We need a process for updating existing records. So currently we're working on focusing on new records. We're going to develop a process that would allow us to update new uh, records with new descriptions and new holdings information in cases like the manuscript has moved, its call number or, or internal identifier has changed. We need to implement import process, the import process for two remaining data fields the dated field, which indicates whether or not a manuscript is internally dated, the, and the uniform title field. This is, a, this is a lower priority for us, as a very small number of the doc manuscripts that we'll be importing have uh, a uniform title value in their mark records, or may have so in, their, in other types of sources, but um, we want to make sure that we, we offer this as well. Uh, we need, uh, we're going to build a process for uh, ingesting CSV sources. So for instance, now we have a complete process for extracting data from MARC XML, TEI XML, and the legacy DS METS data from the Berkeley database. But we want to be able to accept, uh, and we will accept uh, data from uh, members that don't have these types of records to provide. And then finally, we want a DSID uh, URR, URL resolution, resolution service. DSIDs become really useful 
uh, not just when they can be used as a way to refer to a manuscript, but they can be used for digital citation uh, and for connecting to DS records. Uh, we want to be able to make these connections, even in cases where in the event that, that our data has moved from uh, wiki data or the wiki data identifiers uh, have changed internally. And so we'll need a, a service that would allow, <clears throat> and this is actually a relatively simple service to build, but that will allow users to uh, use the DS IDs and but the DS name IDs and find the correct record in our in the in DS uh, wiki base. Um, so kind of dovetailing on the the usefulness in terms of how DS is um, its redevelopment is going to be part of a larger linked data infrastructure. I want to point to uh, some of the work that we've done developing a workflow for um, for our name authority that's in DS uh, 2.0. And um, on the next slide, what that looks like is um, this process that I've worked out through um, uh, through the work of um, some assistance with, from Mario Sassi, um, who's a doctoral candidate at University of Pennsylvania, and um, his appointment is funded through a Domus Foundation grant. Um, but essentially the, what the process looks like is for those names, and, and this is a sort of one of the, the most troublesome of the metadata elements um, that we've had to deal with, is that there's obviously a large number of very unique names and they may or may not be present in other name authorities. Um, but part of our workflow is built on um, those names being present in Wikidata and we pull in um, QIDs from Wikidata in order to build our name authority. Um, so what we've done is we've isolated a number of names we just couldn't reconcile to, to Wikidata. And through Mario's work, um, he's been, and his subject knowledge, he's been able to um, sort of, in some cases, find the names that are already present in Wikidata, so that's easy. Um, but in a lot of other cases, we just didn't have good leads. Um, there just wasn't a, a name present in Wikidata already, a named entity. Um, so we thought, we can add these to Wikidata, we can enrich Wikidata, and in turn, enrich our work as part of DS uh, 2.0. Um, but the important thing to note about Wikidata is you can't just add anything. Um, there has to be what they call a, a criteria met for notability. And uh, one of the ways that we're meeting the notability, there's three notability criteria, and um, the one that we're meeting is the idea that this, there's evidence that this entity exists somewhere else um, from an authoritative source. So um, what we've done is we've been able to create these named entities in Wikidata by um, him researching um, their existence in a, a number of other authorities, and I've listed them here. So we use those other authorities as an anchor then to enrich Wikidata with existing authority data that's found elsewhere in typical you know, library and cultural heritage institution authorities. Um, we're able to then add our data, a little bit of, of data just indicating um, how it's how these people are related to the specific manuscripts that are that are represented in DS 2.0. We name we add those named entities to Wikidata, essentially creating Wikidata items, and then we funnel them back to build our our uh, DS name authority. So we were able to now reconcile the names back to something that exists in Wikidata. And he's done tremendous work in identifying these um, these names. And in addition to that, um, we have a in some cases, a lot of provenance related data um, that's often used to describe the relationships of former owners. And he's done a very good uh, job of uh, finding those names as well. Um, and so we're in the process of um, a number of names have already been added to Wikidata and then funneled back through our workflow. Um, but we, we have a, a few more to add, um, but but really we're in good stead. And this gives us a, a way forward for when new names come up in, in new member contributed data. So the two big developments that I'm going to, the two developments I'm going to talk about next, Wikibase Cloud and our work on the public website are just, they're really happening both at the same time this fall and they're, they're both really, they're, they're very exciting. The, the first is that, of the two, is that we uh, found out uh, that recently we're notified by the Wikibase Cloud that we would be able to host, uh, that we, that our account was available and we can, uh, 
began hosting our Wikibase instance there. So Wikibase Cloud is a Wikibase hosted service that is uh, that is offered by Wikimedia Germany. Uh, they are the uh, the maintainers of the Wikibase suite of applications and the and the host of Wikibase Cloud. They're also deeply involved in and Wikibase. Uh, I think everyone knows is the software that runs behind Wikidata, and I believe they may be the primary uh, maintainers of the Wikidata platform. But in any case, uh, they they're they're experts at hosting uh, Wikibase, and we're very excited to be moving to uh, this service in part because it's an expertise that we don't have. As LP pointed out, one of the reasons that our current Wikibase uh, cloud a Wikibase instance is not available for public access is security. And that's because uh, I and, and the other staff here at Penn Libraries, we lack the expertise to, uh, we lack expertise in the Wikibase platform. So this is great. It means that we can really focus on uh, Wiki, on, on digital scriptorium work and not be worrying about maintaining uh, a Wikibase instance ourselves. The I have already begun uh, doing research and some, made some small experiments at adapting our process for hosting on Wikibase Cloud. Uh, the work will require some modification. It's a slightly different environment, uh, but based on my research, I think we have a clear path forward and we'll be adding data there soon and starting uh, completing that, that migration process. Uh, also mentioned that that I am regularly participating as representing Digital Scriptorium in the Wikibase stakeholders month, uh, monthly group meetings, uh, and I'm in communication with the Wikibase community and the Wikibase Wikimedia staff as I do the work. And it's a very uh, opening and supportive community, and it's, it's exciting both to be doing this work and it's exciting to be a part of that uh, a part of that community. The other really exciting uh, work that we're doing now is the interface development work. Uh, we began uh, work a few weeks ago with uh, Ben Bacalar's firm, Human Experience Systems on the interface design and implementation. Ben, some of you may have already heard his name. He is the developer behind the manuscript project who, that was uh, led by Deborah. And so some of you probably already know that work. We are working on a timeline that has search and browse interface available in the early spring of 2023. The application itself that Ben is building is a Rails blacklight application backed by a solar search, which is a lot of uh, buzzwords, which some of you may know. But if you don't, uh, blacklight uh, and Rails blacklight and solar are the backing technologies that are used for many uh, institutional library catalogs. So this is the uh, Penn Libraries Open Public Access Catalog Franklin. There are many other institutions that use Blacklight. It's also the technology that provides the search for the Schoenberg database of manuscripts. Uh, as such, uh, Metascripta, ah, thank you. Um, uh, as such, uh, Blacklight allows for faceting, both faceting, faceting search, full text search, and advanced search features, the very kind of things that we'll want to have in search for uh, digital scriptorium. Next week, we begin discussions on the user interface, its appearance and capabilities. Uh, so far, we've been discussing mapping the data from our Wikibase uh, format into the front end, selecting items for faceted searching, titles, names, places, support materials, centuries, uh, and then also those items that will be available, available for full text search. Again, titles, different types of notes, physical description. Uh, and I am uh, working closely with uh, computer, with library uh, computers, uh, core services, team to prepare for deploying the user interface for testing, review, and eventual production hosting at Penn Libraries. One of the topics that we're talking about is what is the relationship between the different, uh, the different types of uh, sites and uh, data that we'll be working with. And so we're, the gray box here is 
this undetermined that will as yet you know unfully designed uh, public search interface, but we know that it's going to have its own role in the the ecosystem of the different types of of sites and information sources that it rep that wiki that digital scriptorium represents. So there will be linking from the front end interface back to institutional catalogs. Here's a record from I believe who is this from? It's too tiny for me to see. Um, and then also to the wiki base instance. And of course the wiki base instance will all will be linking to the institutional catalogs as well. So finally, I want to wrap up um, with sort of what the next steps are in terms of um, what we're kind of expecting from uh, from members, and um, getting you in mind of pre preparing for for what for our next steps in terms of the uh, the beta version. Um, so then, so obviously, um, as we've said, the at the end of the year, the beta version um, is really and that process is initiated by having. Um, you know, new data that's beyond the prototype data enter into uh, the database. Um, so just as a heads up, we'll be prioritizing existing legacy data. So all of those METS records that already exist, especially for institutions that rely solely on DS that have no other institutional records, um, we'll be transitioning them back from, from the old DS database into the, into the new 2.0 redevelopment. Um, then the idea is, is that we want you to get in mind in terms of lining yourselves up sort of conceptually for how ready you are to contribute um, updated records. So if you're, again, if you're relying solely on those existing METS records, and that's fine, um, we will be uh, moving those over. Um, if you anticipate that you have up-to-date MARC records that you would prefer uh, to have uploaded um, or other kinds of um, uh, records in other formats, then just keep in mind that um, it's, you know, after the first of the year, that's when we will be um, contacting you for that, a little bit of that process that Doug um, hinted at. I also just want to um, reiterate some important business that I think has been reiterated by other folks, but um, if you have updates to contact information, especially um, for uh, member rep information, please get that to us. Um, again, member uh, membership fees have been invoiced, so, um, and I believe those are, are due fairly soon in terms of um, the window of time that we've given. And then uh, in addition to that, if you would like to, uh, to schedule individual member meetings, we're happy to do that um, to talk you through uh, any part of our, our process, whether it's the, the 2.0 implementation or um, anything of our regular business. And with that, um, I thank you for your time and uh, we'll turn it over back to uh, the regular portion of the meeting. Thanks, Alfie and Doug. I thought that was a really uh, excellent overview and hit uh, a lot of the important things that our membership needs to know about, uh, especially for the next coming weeks. Are there any questions from anyone or concerns? Um, I have a question, if that's OK. Yeah. Uh, hi, I was just wondering, um, from an end user standpoint, at what point is the product ready for, say, um, students and faculty who just want to search the manuscripts to use? Um, is when once the beta goes live, would we want to share that with them, or do we want to wait until the whole new interface is ready to go in spring 2023? I think it depends on what kind of a user you are. So if you're comfortable with using something uh, like the interface that you experience with Wikidata, um, you could use the beta version as is. It's essentially both, it's a, it's a web accessible linked database um, at its core. If you are used to using the previous interface and, and you're used to using something that's more akin to um, a library catalog, then you would wait for the, the full user interface to be built. Yeah, I would say that that searching for searching for items in Wikibase is often less straightforward than than you would expect, and so uh, if you weren't familiar with that or com comfortable with that type of uh, interaction, then that that would be could be frustrating. Uh, Drew Hicks, I see you have your question. 
have a question? Yeah, a, a question about the scalability of the name authority uh, process right now in terms of the, the target number of manuscripts that DS 2.0, you know, is looking to expand towards, you know, uh, to what what percentage, so to speak, within the test data are you really, you know, manually uh, doing that process? And is that going to be a kind of bottleneck uh, at scale? The good news is that it's not a bottleneck in terms of ingesting the data. It's a bottleneck in terms of the enrichment of the data. So the names are still available and they'll still be available for full text search, but they will not be enhanced with being linked to an entity in Wikidata. So it doesn't, it doesn't obscure the data. It's just not any different than it already exists. There's no value added. Um, I have to say though, that I've been impressed with how quickly the process for actually resolving who these identities are has moved um, a lot more quickly than I thought it would. And so that's encouraging in the future. Now, granted, we're going to have probably thousands of more names, but I think it's also likely that many, many of those names are sort of regular, <laughs> regular suspects in manuscript description. So um, a lot of our existing um, automated processes will catch those names. Um, I think in terms of the prototype data, it was about two thirds to two thirds automated to one third manual. Um, but again, the the manual ones um, were rather easy to find in the sense that they weren't obscure; they just weren't being found by the automated reconciliation services. And then and then we had another handful of things that um, we really needed to to delve into other authorities. Um, if folks wanted to work with us to be able to develop reconciliation services for these other authorities, that would solve some of, some of our problems, but that's almost, that's a larger development question um, and, a, and a lot of, and having to put a lot of resources behind something that's sort of relatively small at this point. Yeah, and I, and I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna add that our, our, our system, uh, of our workflow system is really designed to to reduce the number of of names that we have to reconcile uh, each time. So, uh, apart from names that are sort of unique or difficult to, to run down, uh, as as LP is saying, there'll be a lot of you know people that are that, that are come up quite commonly, and so uh, that it should work that it doesn't become an onerous process. It becomes a more manageable process over time. The, the really, the, the tricky thing is, lot, is individual names, like names that occur once or twice. Those, that list will grow, but at the same time, you're also in a place where leveraging, uh, leveraging reconciliation, leveraging linking these two authorities actually provides, doesn't provide that much more to you because they're, they're those you know, unique or, you know, names that occur once or twice. And I was just going to add that there are um, kind of running parallel to Digital Scriptorium and the Schreiber database. I'm involved with a working group uh, for name authorities related to pre-modern manuscript projects, actually Doug and, and LP and Lisa comes to our meetings. And so this is something, you know, adding a uh, names involved in the production and trade of uh, pre-modern manuscripts to Wikidata um, may become a larger project, which would impact digital scriptorium in the sense that all those projects that are contributing their uh, name data to Wikidata um, will be supplying those, you know, the, the, the QIDs that, that we need to populate um, and reconcile for, um, for DS names. So it, it's a good question, especially when it, when we consider that we're opening the scope of Digital Scriptorium to include non-Western, and there's a lot of work to be done on names <clears throat> in non-Western traditions. Um, but it's something that a lot of people are thinking about and, and circling around Wikidata as the place to contribute those names. And I think it's a it's a very sort of interesting uh, area for future research and 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 applying for grants and and that sort of project uh, that that sort of funding to um you know to make to make this kind of a research project make make this part of the research process because I think name authorities are an incredibly rich 
uh, an untapped resource for, for research. Are there any other questions? I don't see any more hands raised. All right, thanks LP and Doug. Um, and now uh, I wanna hand it over to Amy Pickard, who is the rare book curator for our new member um, at the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. And she's gonna say a few words about the collection uh, and and how they uh, came to be members of Digital Scriptorium. So Amy, I'll just, I'll hand it over to you. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Amy Pickard, the rare book curator at the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, which is in Buffalo, New York. And yeah, on behalf of our library, I just wanna say it is a pleasure to be a member of the Digital Scriptorium and to be here with you today. Uh, this will be the non-technical side of this meeting. <laughs> um, I thought you might like to hear a little bit about our journey and, and how a library, a public library of our size uh, became so interested and, and uh, now are, we are now actually a member of the Digital Scriptorium. I've worked in special collections since 2004 uh, and more specifically in the rare book room since 2006. My since retired colleagues and I first heard about the Digital Scriptorium in fall of 2009 when we visited the Houghton Library and we met then curator of early books and manuscripts, William P. Stoneman. He was the most gracious host. Uh, who, he even bothered to check our holdings before we arrived and knew that our library had some medieval manuscripts. He suggested that they ought to be included in the Digital Scriptorium and gave us some information about it. And I still have this card that he gave to me then. Uh, since that visit, it's been my goal on behalf of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library's rare book collection to become part of the Digital Scriptorium. However, we had one major obstacle. We did not and do not have a cataloger on staff with a specific level of expertise necessary to correctly catalog our medieval and Renaissance manuscripts. By this, I mean someone who could both correct the inaccurate and, uh, and also complete the inadequate adequate, uh, catalog records that were done many years ago. Fast forward nine years and Consuelo Dutki, then the curator of medieval and Renaissance collections at Columbia University, visited our library to see our manuscripts in 2018. She also suggested that we ought to have our collection included in the digital scriptorium. I said that we would love to, but explained that the cataloging was holding us back and there was no solution at that time. Then in January of this year, medieval manuscript specialist Peter Kidd contacted us with questions about our manuscripts that had been displayed at the Everson Museum in Syracuse, New York in 1974. We had several emails back and forth. Well, Peter found our collection interesting. Everything that he shared with us was enlightening to us. Uh, some of what he found you can actually read about in Peter's January 29th blog entry at his um, mssprominence.blogspot.com blog. In our emails, Peter also recommended we become part of the digital scriptorium. I explained once again, that we would if we could find a cataloger who could properly catalog our stuff. He suggested Consuelo Duchki, whom he knew, uh, who we knew from her visit in 2018. Since she had since retired, she might now be willing to catalog our material. When I asked her if she, she would, her reply was the most warm and benevolent yes. Both Peter and Consuelo gave me Lynn Ransom's contact for information about the Digital Scriptorium 2.0 and membership. Thankfully, our institution's Assistant Deputy Director of Public Services, Dorinda Darden, and Library Director, John Spears, recommended the importance of uh, becoming part of the Digital Scriptorium. Even though we are a public library and there are so many other things we focus on as such. So here we are today. 
The Buffalo and Erie County Public Library is finally a member of the Digital Scriptorium, and we are busily digitizing our manuscripts for our digital collections and to link those records that will appear in DS 2.0. I cannot tell you how grateful we are for Peter and Consuelo's generosity with their time and willingness to share their knowledge. Without either of them, our participation in Digital Scriptorium would not have been possible. I would like to say thank you to them both very much. Uh, just a, a little bit about our collection itself. Uh, this would have been um, a little bit more in detail uh, however, the meeting on my Outlook calendar for this annual <laughs> meeting was for Friday, so um, this is somewhat abbreviated. Um, our, our list, our working list is up to 41 items, most of which are single leaves, but there are a few brown manuscripts as well, um, and this includes Western and non-Western manuscripts. Some of our holdings appear in the Derici census, but many do not. Uh, we have in Derici, what we have in Derici can be found listed under our institutional predecessors, the Buffalo Public Library and the Grosvenor Library. Those libraries merged with the Erie County Public Library to become the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. The Grosvenor Library's list, Grosvenor Library was a reference library. And its list is much greater than that of the Buffalo Public Library. Um, and that was due in large part to a purchase of the Lewis Charles Elson collection in 1924. Elson was a music critic and a prolific writer about music. So as you would imagine, most of the manuscripts Elson collected were music related. But there have been additions to the collections over the years. And again, I. I deeply apologize that I haven't um, the pictures to share with you, again, thinking that this um, was uh, taking place uh, two days from now. So um, this may be the shortest part of the program, and, and I do apologize for that, but it's so great to, to be among you to actually be now a member of Digital Scriptorium. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Amy. Um, I think Lisa, Lisa, you put you posted a link to um, the fifty original leaves portfolio. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, those of those we actually digitized for Lisa's class, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and of course we'll be adding to the digital collections um, the the other manuscripts in our collections as they are literally being digitized as I speak, <laughs> so. Well, we look forward to being able to um, to get that data out for you. And we're, you know, just to just to sort of follow up on your comment about being a public library, I think it's so important that public libraries that have uh, collections are part of Digital Scriptorium. <clears throat> I think that's where we're gonna find, or, you know, scholars are gonna find a lot of new discoveries, a lot of things that haven't been uh, published as much or are well known to the, uh, academic community. Um, so, so we're just so grateful for you uh, for joining and whatever we can do to help um, to get your data into Digital Scriptorium. Uh, you know, we're, we're here and, and ready to help. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Amy about the collections? Vanessa? I have a question, Amy. Thank you for sharing this and welcome to Digital Scriptorium. Um, I was just curious if you think this is an area where the public library might grow at all or where you think is your, you know, if you have incunables or older materials in the collections or um, if you, if there's ways you might anticipate the unexpected discovery here. We certainly would be open to growing that collection. Um, our focus has been uh, more so in the fine press um, editions and um, materials related to uh, some of the more significant uh, things in our collections, such as the Audubon birds, a recent acquisition of Wilson's American Ornithology, um, things of that nature have been our primary focus, but, but we uh, 
fully understand the importance of growing a collection um, in general and manuscripts uh, certainly will be, you know, considered in, in the acquisitions going forward. Any other questions? Tibble Jim, your hand is raised. Thank you. Oh, this is so exciting, I think. And uh, I'm also, you know, due to my new position, which entails teaching, uh, I am also thinking maybe we can collaborate with uh, libraries to catalog their manuscripts also through digital means. We don't have to be there. To some extent, this cataloging can be done. I would also be interested in for example, in uh, Amy's case, if uh, you know such wonderful, uh, you know, experts like Consuelo and Peter uh, are already providing descriptions, but uh, maybe not in a format that is uh, suitable for ingesting into a digital scriptorium, such as uh, XML cataloging, uh, I could be of assistance through students as well and other colleagues who are working on cataloging manuscripts in these ways. I'm also curious how, to what extent your rare books have been cataloged in the sense that is there possibilities of finding manuscript fragments? Uh, did, you, did you conduct a survey uh, to this end? Thank you. Well, I, as I, I think I mentioned, um, it, it wasn't just that our catalog records for these manuscripts were inadequate, they were in some cases just incorrect. <laughs> so so uh, once um, Consuelo's done with her magical work, <laughs> we have an opportunity to uh, correct those records uh, and plan to do so. Um, other than that, um, using Dorici or um, uh, more open ways of searching our catalog when they find you know the sort of thing that they're looking for in terms of manuscripts um just keeping in mind that there's a, a lot of room for improvement <laughs> i think that's true i think everybody uh on this um, on this meeting can say that's true of a lot of their uh, catalog. There's always room for improvement, um, no matter how perfect you think your, your cataloging records are. Um, there's a question from Deborah Cashin. How did Buffalo Erie manage and fund the, the digitization of their manuscripts? So we, we actually have um, a person on staff who uh, wears many hats and uh, the, the bulk of her time recently has been spent digitizing um, this collection. Uh, so, so we've dedicated most of that staff person's time to all of our digitization projects. Um, I wouldn't say that this is the best way to do that. <laughs> I think if you can have uh, more adequate staffing to um, achieve these projects, it would uh, be a lot less stressful <laughs> for everyone involved, um, but but we're you know we're incrementally tackling it. Um, so how do we manage it um, as well as we can? <laughs> I guess is the answer to that question. Any other questions about? Um... Well, questions for Amy or for the board or LP or, or Doug, any lingering thoughts? Well, if not, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Congratulations to the new board members um, and to the new members of Digital Script Forum. We're excited to have you all on board. And we look forward to uh, working with you in the future and, and getting more information to you um, about Digital Scriptorium 2.0, uh, getting that, that to you soon. All right, well, I think we can adjourn this meeting. Uh,
I'm looking at Vanessa, who's my Roberts rule expert. Do we need to have motions to adjourn or do we, can we just adjourn the, the meeting? Well, let's just be technical about it and uh, <laughs> I will submit a motion that we adjourn this meeting. And another board member second. I will, second. it's Sue. <laughs> Excellent, all in favor say aye. 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 All in favor say nay. <laughs> Excellent. We're done. Um, we'll be in touch soon. Please uh, check your spam folders for uh, if, if you're if you think you aren't getting announcements from our Mailchimp newsletter service. Uh, please uh, be in touch, and we'll we'll see if there's a problem with the email or or what. But this is our primary means of communication. I think probably most people in this meeting are getting the emails. Um, but if you uh, if there are people at your institutions who you also think should be getting this information, please encourage them to sign up to the newsletter by going to the, the DS website. All right, thank you everyone. Great job. Bye and see you soon. Bye guys. Thank Bye. you, Lynn.